Hi everyone and welcome back. Today we are going to be talking about how to introduce your literary argument. Structuring your opening with a claim and reasons. So previously I had you watch the lecture about how to support your literary argument. Um, I can't remember at the moment if I called it the peel or the teal method, but we're going to go into that in a little bit more detail this time, um, this week. Um, that's supporting each paragraph, your body paragraph is going to be the next lecture. But I wanted to create a lecture for you where I just talk about the introduction. I think a lot of times people struggle with the introduction for their literary argument and they fall into some pretty common pitfalls. I'm going to cover each one of those, show you what other students have done in the past and how they have revised their work to make it a stronger argument. The importance of the introduction really is that you're setting the focus for your paper, you're giving me your overall argument, you're giving me um, you know, the direction that your paper is going to go in. So if you don't have a good introduction, it can be hard to follow the rest of your argument. So let's get started. Um, an introduction typically is structured like this. Context, so what's the, the issue or the problem you're addressing? This says question. Um, a lot of people, when they're first writing essays, start with a question because they were taught to do that in middle school or high school. It's not a bad way to start if you're first learning how to structure an essay. You start with a question, and then you go about answering a question. In college, we're kind of moving up a step to a little bit more advanced way of writing so that instead of having a question, you are having a claim first and proving that claim. The question really should be what drives your research, not what drives your paper, if that makes sense. So your position, your claim, your thesis statement, um, and then an overview of your argument, your main points. So what we're going to be doing is looking at context um, and then a claim. And then here in an argument, these are going to be your reasons. Now, if you're not writing an argument, they're gonna be the main points and you're gonna have a thesis statement. Maybe if you're informing someone about something, um, then it's not quite structured the same way. But for a literary argument, this is the basic structure and hopefully you learn this in college composition. The first question people have is that they don't really understand how to argue about literature. So it's not quite what it sounds like. A literary argument can be a review. So you can have a critic who argues that a piece of literature is good, um, worthy of reading, or bad. Um, so if you go on Goodreads, for example, or Amazon, you can see a lot of book reviews that do this. Uh, Harry Potter is the best YA series of all time, or the novel Frankenstein is boring. When you're arguing about literature, it's a little bit different than doing a review. Um, for our class, when we talk about literary argument, it means that you're making a case that a poem, a story, or a play should be interpreted in a certain way. Um, I like this little infographic. Your thesis will not rather necessarily argue for a position rather it's a particular perspective on the material so what is your perspective um, without using first person language what's your perspective on this poem or on this short story or on this play um, so we're going to be looking at introductions from papers that people wrote um, I think last year or the year before a couple of years ago maybe um, about the poem, The Goblin Market. And we're going to see how each one of these introductions tries to argue um, for a persp particular perspective on that material, on that poem. How should things be interpreted? The first step is developing your claim. In college composition, you learned about claim, reason, and evidence. So for example, um, People should not smoke because it's harmful for their health 
here is a research study showing how what percentage of people get lung cancer from smoking, right? That's a claim, reason, and a piece of evidence. In the claim is the overall argument, and that is basically one to two sentences that contain the central idea for your interpretation. So here is the prominent theme of the poem, or the character is developed this way because this is a statement and not a question, just to kind of reiterate that. And it should be written in the third person. Sometimes I'll ask, um, you know, at the end of your paper, in the conclusion, for you to give your opinion. Did you like it? Did you not like it? But that's not what you're really writing about. And I have to say this because every semester I get at least one or two papers where the person's just talking about why they liked the poem or why they liked the play. Um, and that's not to do with interpretation. So be careful of falling into that trap. So what will your claim focus on? In more advanced literature classes, you might have more subtle claims. You might look at a small piece of a poem, maybe just a stanza, or if you're looking at a story, maybe a, a paragraph, or if you're looking at a book, maybe a chapter. This is called a close reading. So um, analyzing one character in a story or a piece of dialogue in a play. Doing a close reading means that you kind of take just a small portion and you explain what that means, how it relates to the whole, how it should be interpreted. For this class, that's not really what I'm gonna ask you to do. What I want you to do really is look at themes, which we've talked about already, large abstract concepts in the work, and then the meaning of the piece, which is different from the theme. A lot of people think theme and meaning are the same, they are not. Um, what's the author's message to the audience? So what do they want us to know or believe or to understand or to learn? That's essentially what your claim will focus on. So you will have claims like the author's central message is blank or the meaning of this is blank or the author's most prominent themes are A, B, and C. For example, okay, so here we have a picture um, from one of the illustrated versions of the Goblin Market. Um, there are many themes in this poem. Some of them include female sexuality, temptation, religion, sisterhood, family, love, sacrifice, and pleasure. Lots of themes. If you were asked which was the most important theme in the poem, it really would depend on how you read and interpreted the poem. So one person, um, and I think I have, here we go. What theme is emphasized here? This is not a picture that puts an emphasis on female sexuality. We have a very young girl and all of the fruit kind of looks normal. And here are the goblins. They're um, little creatures. They look kind of cute here. There are some frogs and some cats and some um, kind of humanoid <laughs> creatures. They kind of look like people. Um, and a badger over here. And she's being tempted by their fruit. And it looks almost like a really cute scene uh, if you haven't read the poem. So if I were to look at this painting... I would say that here the um, the poet or the the illustrators are trying to place an emphasis on youth and innocence, right? Her sister's not there, even though they're together in almost every single scene. Um, there, there's not as much temptation here as in other depictions. Um, we, we're not seeing yet love or sacrifice or pleasure. So this person probably read the poem and saw it more like a children's story um, about innocence and about maybe, a, you know, those kind of things. Other people have read the story and come out with very different interpretations. So let's look at three different claims. 
The most prominent theme in the goblin market is sisterhood and family. The poet's message is that women are stronger when they support each other. So here's an illustration that kind of emphasizes that. Um, the one sister is taking care of the other one and the goblins are kind of in the background, right? They're not as important as this primary relationship. The most prominent theme in the goblin market is female sexuality. The poet's message is that women should not be shamed when they fall into sexual temptation, but can be redeemed from their fallen state. And here, um, this is a picture from Playboy's version, um, which I showed you guys in that lecture, I think. She's naked. They're crawling on top of her. It's quite sexual, a lot different than this interpretation. So you can even see how the artists themselves interpret things differently this artist is not as concerned with women supporting each other right they're concerned with the sexual temptation and falling into it and um you know the lasciviousness of the poem the most prominent theme in goblin market is temptation the poet's message does not center on food or sexuality but is a general warning about the dangers of being tempted and the benefits of resisting temptation okay so here is the thing that I think people kind of make fun of with literature and some people like and some people don't. None of these claims are wrong. So it really, if you have something that's really far off left field, like the central message of the goblin market has to do with a communist society of Russia. No, there's no there's no evidence for that in the poem. There's no evidence for that in the author's life. You're not going to be able to find any critics who agree with that statement. OK, but you can support any one of these interpretations. If you think that sisterhood and family is the central theme or if you think that female sexuality is the central theme or if you think that temptation um, in general, the dangers of being tempted and the benefits of resisting, that's the central theme. You can find evidence to support any one of these claims. And we're going to talk about evidence and, and body paragraphs later, but the important thing to know is that in this case, there's no one right answer. For some people, like my brother is very scientific. He's a physician's assistant and he hates that about books and he hated that about his English classes. He was like, you, you never really know. And a lot of times people will even say to me in my classes, well, what does it mean? And they want me to just kind of give them the right answer like there is one right answer. And there's just not. There's just not. There's a lot of different ways it can be looked at. And it really is almost up to you, the reader, to decide which one stands out more for you. Maybe you read it and you have a sister and that's important to you and you can see that in the poem. Maybe you read it and you have issues with food and eating and the temptation of food is the thing that sticks out to you. Um, as long as you can support it with evidence from the text, um, that's the important thing. So after the claim come the reasons, I believe because. Um, reasons support your claim. So in a literary argument, at least again for this class, what I'm asking you to do is look at the literary elements that help to develop the theme or contribute to the meaning or the message of the work. That is primarily what your reasons are going to be. In other classes, and if you take American literature or children's literature with me down the line, um, I, I also sci-fi, also various other things, um, if you take a class like that with me down the road, then we look at other we kind of get into argument a little bit more detail but this is an introductory class and it's you know it's trying to get you to build those skills to start with so for example we just looked at this the most prominent theme in the goblin market is temptation so that's the person's claim the author develops this theme through imagery illusion and conflict there's a little typo there sorry so through imagery, illusion, and conflict. Those three things are going to be the reasons. And I would expect in a paper, if it is, say, 
three pages long that you would have one page for each of those things. A lot of times people think that their reasons should be paragraphs and really I would like you to think of them more like sections. So almost like you're doing an outline in your introduction. Now I have a focus here in my claim, I know what you're going to be focusing on, and I have direction. The three things that you're going to look at throughout the paper. And I would guess that imagery is going to be first, and then illusions, and then conflict. Um, the rich imagery of the tempting fruit is found throughout the poem. The central conflict centers on the sisters being tempted and resisting temptation, and the biblical illusions in the poem help to reinforce the idea that temptation must be resisted. So this is really nice. This is from a real paper. Um, the only thing I don't like is that they, they, they change the order, but that's fine. So the rich imagery, there's a sentence here. Central conflict, there's a sentence here. And illusions, there's a sentence here. Okay. Now, not only do I have direction and kind of an outline, I also have a summary. Put little things here so you remember. So focus, direction, and summary. People get this confused all the time and we're going to look at a, uh, an example of a paper that gets this confused. You are not summarizing the poem or the short story or the play. You're summarizing your main points. That's what you're doing. So the author um, here has done a great job of that. The imagery is found throughout the poem. The conflict centers on the sisters being tempted. The biblical illusions reinforce the idea that temptation should be resisted. Now, what am I going to have right up off the bat? The next paragraph of this paper was about imagery and focusing especially on the fruit. Then they gave some other images and some other symbols as well. So um, that is a really good example of a well-structured introduction. So here is our first problem introduction. Um, it doesn't have a claim and it doesn't have reasons. So there's no direction or focus. So here's what she had. I'm not going to read the whole thing for you because it's long. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> every evening, the, the sisters resist the call to buy luscious fruit from the goblin men. Laura lingers. Lizzie chides her to save Laura, who is in danger. Lizzie offers the goblins to pay for fruit. Um, they crush fruit on her because she refuses to eat it. She remains unsullied. It's both a poison and an antidote. Later on, time passes. Both of them marry and they warn their children. Okay. So here's the issue. I put a B in the M and an E. This is the beginning of the poem. This is the middle of the poem. This is the end of the poem. This person has given me a summary and an actual fact um, I don't have the whole thing for you guys today, but the second and third paragraphs were more summary, just going into further detail of each one of these parts. So what happened was, uh, when I talked to this student, I said, you have a thesis that's buried in the fourth paragraph. I don't even know if it is your thesis because it's so far down. And there's no introduction, there's no focus. So it's really hard for me to understand what you're trying to say about how the poem should be interpreted because most of the paper is just summarizing different points over and over and over. So we went through, um, and or she went through rather, sorry, <laughs> we. Um, I gave her the feedback and she went through. And the yellow part is her claim. So the prominent theme running throughout the poem is temptation. And what she did here is she gave us a little bit of context. 
Sorry for the weird serial killer handwriting. Again, I'm writing with a mouse. So she shortens it from this long, meandering, you know, three three paragraph thing, which again, I've only shown you, you know, one paragraph of. She shortens that up and gives us some context with one, two, three, four sentences. Awesome. Four sentences instead of four paragraphs. We did it. Um, so now that she has context for the poem, I will say too, there, she should have um, had the author's name and the poem uh, title in here as well. She didn't put that in, but at any rate, the prominent theme running throughout the poem is temptation. Now I have a clear claim. The author's message that temptation must be is that temptation must be resisted at all costs. Proofread before you turn things in, folks. Um, but her claim is so much more clear. Desire, regret, and te redemption are motifs used in the poem. So that's our first reason. The motifs along with characterization and a fairy tale set structure contribute to the theme and the author's message. Now, what I really like showing you guys this is because the claim is almost split up into two parts with the reasons in between. And that's a great way to structure it. Having the theme and then the reasons and then how, or the fact that they contribute to the author's message. Um, but now you can see the actual focus for the paper. And indeed, in the revision, motifs was the first section. And she went through and talked about those repeating elements. That's what a motif is. Then she talked about the characters and then the structure. All right, let's look at introduction number two. So this one had a lot of um, wandering and the person also used first person language. It can be really tempting to use first person language, but I have a couple tips for how to avoid it. So the Goblin Market is stated in many lectures as a poem, which the theme may be interpreted in different ways. Here's the thing. We don't need we don't need that. I know that it can be interpreted in in many different ways. I don't you know, you're telling me what my, what the lectures say. Readers may, as I did, begin reading the poem and form an opinion about the theme of the poem. And yet when they finish reading, they have an entirely different interpretation. This actually, I don't hate this. I actually think that this person is correct. But I think that it would have been better perhaps to put that in the conclusion. And also, there, you, you know, there's a lot of words to say. It's a lot of words that you really don't need. So um, readers may form an opinion at the start of the poem and change their mind by the end. Then it would be in third person and it would be more succinct. While it's possible to see how a reader may interpret the poem in three different ways, I believe the poem is about sisterhood and women being begin, typo, stronger when they support one another. Okay. This is actually a good claim. The problem is that it took us this long. I'm going to erase. Let me, let me erase this. Okay. It took us one, two, really three sentences uh, to get there. And if they had been giving us context, that would have been fine. Um, but they were not. They were kind of just all over the place. And, and this is kind of like a fluff nothing sentence, especially in the first thing. But the claim is good. I think Rossetti used different literary elements such as conflict, foreshadowing, and tone and mood to present her poem and the theme to the reader. Okay, it's not horrible, but if you get rid of these, I believe and I think... While it is possible to see how a reader may interpret the poem in, you don't need that, different ways, the poem is about sisterhood and women. Now you have taken this from an opinion into a claim. An opinion is just how you feel. A claim is something that's backed up by evidence, and you are backing it up by evidence from the poem and from critical sources. At least in this paper they were. So let's see the actual revision of what they ended up with. Oh, here we go. So a lot of times you can just cut these, I believe, in my opinion. You can just cut them. Um, 
the evidence shows, as this example demonstrates, um, the theme is just cut those and go with stronger verbs instead. Verbiage, sorry, not just verbs, <laughs> wording, stronger wording. So here's the revised introduction. The Gar Goblin Market is a poem which may be interpreted in different ways. Since the poem is longer, there are many themes that can be found within the story. Good. Now we have the core of what they were trying to say in those four sentences before. However, the essence of the poem is sisterhood, and the author's message is that women become stronger when they support one another. Now the claim is very clear, and we don't have first-person language. Rossetti uses the literary elements of foreshadowing, tone, and mood, commas, to develop these themes. What we are, I would say this, this is a lot better. It's gone from like, you know, a C minus to maybe a B minus. It's a lot better. I think it would have helped if the author had then had the summary of each one of those points. So one sentence about foreshadowing, one sentence about tone, and one sentence about mood, just to help us go into their paper a little bit more smoothly. I will also say this, um, that they got rid of, let me back it up here, would they have initially conflict? Um, they got rid of conflict. I, I think that that may have been a mistake. I think conflict was still in the essay. But tone and mood are very strongly related. So having those as two separate points, I don't always recommend because they can overlap and then you don't have quite as much to write about. So that's just another outside of this, the issue of structuring your introduction. That's just another thing to consider when you're going to write. All right, let's look at a third one. This actually is not badly written. There are too many reasons, and so our focus is too broad, and I'll, I'll talk about that in just a moment. The Goblin Market is a poem by Christina Rossetti. The poem tells of sisters who are tempted by fruit of goblin merchants. Okay, characters, plot, imagery, setting are like those in the biblical story in the book of Genesis, telling of Eve's temptation and sin. In the Goblin Market, Christina Rossetti uses poetic devices such as symbolism, imagery again, foreshadowing, and illusion. This person has listed seven things and imagery twice. Um, it's too broad of a focus. Again, it's kind of all over there, the place. And what's sad about that is that this idea that this poem is like the story in the book of Genesis of Eve's temptation and sin, that's getting lost in the middle of this paragraph with this long list of all of these reasons. And really, if you were writing, I don't know, a 20-page paper or a 30-page paper, maybe you could cover all seven of these things in the detail that you need. But in the, the length that I'm asking for, you really aren't going to be able to. And you're going to end up with thin paragraphs that don't say anything. And you're going to start repeating yourself, actually, because it's too much. Too much. So let's see this person's, uh, let's see his revision. Introduction revised. The Goblin Market is written by P Rosita, Christina Rossetti. And so, again, we have our context here right? And this is kind of interesting. I kind of like this structure as well. Um, a lot of times I say, you know, have the context and then your claim and then your reasons. This person flipped it, but I think that the flipping really works. So the characters, plot, imagery, and setting are like those in the biblical story in the book of Genesis. These biblical allusions contribute to the theme of temptation. They're still listing five things, and I think I would, they didn't want to cut too much of what they had written before, but to be honest, you probably could take one of those out. The, the imagery is going to be connected to the setting, possibly. You're talking about the characters and the plot. You know, pick three of those four and keep the illusion, because that, the illusion really is the centerpiece of this argument. Um, 
they contribute to the theme of temptation. Ultimately, the poet's message is that a person who has fallen to temptation can be redeemed and restored. This restoration can only happen through sacrifice and love. Great. Now I have a really strong thesis. And to be honest, this makes me want to read this paper because it has an interesting take. There's an interesting interpretation. They're, they have an interesting focus. They have the context, the reasons, and the claim. Um, much better. Still a little bit too much in my opinion, but much better than the first version. And the ideas are more organized. All right, introduction four. Again, this actually is not a horrible introduction, and the paper was not bad in and of itself. But it's a little bit wordy, and I think that um, it's not as clear as it could be. So we'll look at what she did first and then how she fixed it. Um, so the context here. Um, a poem about twin sisters who have their deepest and most primitive feelings of sexual desire tempted by goblin merchants selling voluptuous fruit, blah, blah, blah. Okay, great. That's our context. Then we have our claim. Thus, female sexuality is the most prominent theme of the poem. The poet's message is that women should not be shamed when they fall into sexual temptation but can be redeemed. Great. That's the claim. Then we have... These statements about sexuality that maybe don't fit quite. Every woman has wants and needs and sexual desire is no exception. Then we have the three conflicts, symbolism and illusion, our three reasons. And then we have more. Instead of going into these specifically, we have this long thing about women falling into temptation and they're wiser at the end of it and they're a reminder to their themselves and other women and i just don't there's a couple things here uh it it's it's meandering it's kind of makes me feel like it's all over the place so i don't know um whether this is going to have a good focus in the rest of the paper as, as a teacher, when I'm looking at this, I'm like, I, I don't really quite, I kind of, I get where they're going because they have a thesis here, but then I don't know if they're going to stay on track. Um, so let's look at what she did to fix it. So she kept the context pretty much exactly how it was. And then what I thought was interesting was that she broke up her claim. Female sexuality is most prominent theme of the poem. Every woman has wants, needs, and desires, and sexual desires of women are no exception. That, to me, actually works better here because it's explaining, it's connecting the idea of female sexuality to the poet's message. So it's connecting the theme and the message. The poet's message is that women should not be shamed. Um, so again, that part, the wording is actually the same. The poem is dripping with conflict, symbolism, and illusion, that portray how deliciously powerful temptation can be. So now we have, I don't think she had this phrase before, did she? Yes, she did. Okay. So that phrase to me, though, sticks out more here because there's less after it and because we have this split up. So it connects the ideas a little bit better. Um, even though a woman may fall victim to temptation, it makes her no less of a woman. In fact, it makes them stronger and wiser women. There's a little bit of uh, pronoun agreement problem, but she's cut the four sentences down to two, and it's a lot more clear. So what's interesting is, you know, when you're editing, a lot of times people just look for, oh, this paragraph is out of place, or I have, you know, a, a grammatical error. What I really liked about her editing is that she did what's called line editing, where she really went paragraph by paragraph, line by line, reorganized this, and just cut here. And and honestly, in terms of um, what she wrote, if you notice from before, the wording isn't that different, but the reorganization and the cuts that she made help the claim and the reasons to stand out and help to make it more impactful as an introduction. 
So let's recap. Your introduction can have an overview of the work for context. This can should really only be a couple sentences. Should not be a full summary. Your claim is one to two sentence statement that contains your primary argument about how a work should be interpreted. That is what you're arguing. Your introduction should also have one to three sentences stating your reasons for believing that interpretation. The reasons are the literary elements such as characterization, plot, setting and imagery, etc. The things that we've been talking about um, so far this semester that the author uses to develop the theme and convey the message. An argument is not the same as an opinion. An opinion is a personal feeling. An argument is going to have reasons and evidence to support and prove each point. So this is important as well. We're going to look at it in the next lecture. What I don't want you to do is have um, no evidence to support your point. So if you have that imagery helps to develop the theme, you better give me some examples of imagery. If you don't have examples of imagery, then you need to change it and, and have a different reason to support your claim. So we've talked about claims and reasons. Next, we're going to talk about evidence and we're going to look at how you can use evidence to prove your thesis. And I look forward to reading your introductions and looking at your papers. Thanks, everybody. Stay tuned for the next one.